Hi everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We'll take two more minutes for others to join us. All right, I think we'll go ahead and start um, and attendees will continue to join us. Thank you so much, um, everyone, for joining today. Um, my name is Pramoda and I'm the System Curator of Education and Public Programs at the Museum of Modern and Contemporary at Sri Lanka. So on behalf of the museum, I'm delighted to welcome all of you to the second talk of the second edition of Support Local Art, the talk series. Um, the project was initiated by Saskia Fernando Gallery last year in order to provide a platform for dialogue about Sri Lankan modern and contemporary art, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. As a follow-up, Saskia Fernando Gallery invited the MMCA Sri Lanka to curate and host the second edition this year. The three uh, through the three talks, uh, we plan on addressing the role of art in relation to community, cultural diplomacy, and humor bringing together a host of panelists from different backgrounds with different points of view. The first talk was held two weeks ago and you can access the recording on our Facebook. Today's talk is the second of three and we'll focus on the power of di diplomacy with the panelists, uh, Aurelia Collard, cultural attaché, French embassy in Sri Lanka, George Cook, academic and diplomatic historian, and Kelly McCarthy, first secretary, public affairs section, U.S. Embassy in Sri Lanka, and they will talk about the role of diplomacy in relation to arts and culture, alongside our moderator, Shamini Pereira, Chief Curator of the MMCA Sri Lanka. Before we start, and, and I hand over to Shamini, I would like to thank our panelists for choosing to be here today, despite the ongoing crisis in the country and uh, dealing with different time zones. Uh, we would also like to thank Nations Trust Private Banking and Saskia Fernando Gallery for their support. I will now introduce you to our speakers and moderator. Aurelia Collard is the cultural attaché of the Embassy of France in Sri Lanka and the Maldives, where she coordinates cultural activities and cooperation between France and Sri Lanka. 
Previously, after graduating in international relations from Sciences Po Paris, she held positions with the Museums and Society Department of the International Council of Museums, or ICOM, the French Academy in Rome, Villa Medici, and the Country Office of UNESCO in Peru, and the Modern and Contemporary Art Museum, Centre Pompidou. George Cook is a diplomatic historian and academic whose main areas of research include foreign policy, diplomacy, regionalism, and integration. He is a senior lecturer at the Department of International Relations at University of Colombo and an initiator of the Avalog Initiative. He is an alumnus of the Netherlands Institute of International Relations, Flingendale, and recently completed, completed his PhD at the University of Colombo. George joined the Sri Lanka Foreign Service in 2007 and served in the Public Communications Division, the Bureau of the Foreign Minister and the East Asia and Pacific Division of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Sri Lanka. Kelly McCarthy is a career foreign service officer with the US Department of State, specializing in public diplomacy and is the public diplomacy officer for resources and strategic planning with the US Embassy in Colombo. Kelly was most recently assigned as the public affairs officer with the US consulate in Lahore. Previous assignments include the Bureau of South and Central, uh, Central Asian Affairs Press Office, the Dominican Republic, Vietnam, Belize, Bangladesh, the Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations, and the Bureau of Public Affairs Office of Digital Engagement. Our moderator, Shamini Pereira, is Chief Curator of the Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art Sri Lanka. She is the founder and director of Raking Leaves and co-founder of the Sri Lanka Archive of Contemporary Art, Architecture and Design in Jaffna. Shamini lives and works in Sri Lanka. Thank you and handing over to you, Shamini. Thank you very much, Pramoda, and um, a very warm welcome again to everybody that has tuned in this evening. I'm delighted to have um, as panelists, this stellar lineup. Um, thank you again, Kelly, Aurelia, and George. This is um, going to be, I hope, a very fruitful discussion um, amongst us. This idea of cultural dis diplomacy, the subject, is, is huge. It's a huge topic with a far-reaching history. And some might say that it's more relevant today than perhaps ever before, whereas others on the other side of the fence might just say, it has very little role to play today in the political and public arena. But before we go there, I'm, I'd like to start by grounding this discussion by addressing what is it that we, as a group of panelists, understand? What do we understand by the meaning of the term cultural diplomacy? I would like to invite Aurelia to begin. Um, Aurelia is somebody who in the panelists um, is the person um, who's bearing this burden of representation around sort of the cultural side of things. You work in the cultural industry very squarely. I'd like to ask you to perhaps give us some kind of grounding about what the cultural element of cultural diplomacy might begin to mean. Thank you. Um, first, thank you, Sharmini and Pramoda, for this uh, very kind and uh, humbling invitation to be here with, with you tonight. Um, so as, uh, as Sharmini was saying, I'm working currently at the French embassy. So of course, cultural diplomacy has been uh, very important for, for the French uh, cultural network and cultural relations since a long time. And just cultural relations in general between countries have been around for a very long time. Um, if we take the example of France under the reign of uh, Louis XIV, for instance, at the end of the 17th century, the French Academy of Rome was already around to send uh, the most uh, prominent French artists of the time in Rome to do their grand tour. Um, to promote the power and glory of the kingdom abroad and to maintain its control over the artistic field towards uh, competing European nations. So even though today uh, we didn't, we're no longer working in this model of like, the rays of sunshine that would be uh, kind of graciating the, the, the nations abroad, um, we do have kind of this heritage. And uh, I'd say that modern cultural diplomacy in Europe can be rather traced back to the end of the 19th century with the creation of the Fondation Alliance Française in 1883. 
that was followed by the Italian Societa Dante Alighieri in 1889 uh, to promote their own language and culture through a network of institutes across the world. Um, so this is just to give a sort of like institutional framework and what has led to institutionalize uh, this external cultural action. So in the case of France also, um, in addition to the Alliance Française who are independent associations, the Association Française d'Action Artistique, which is the French Association of Artistic Creation, was created in 1922 to promote French artists abroad, which later became the Institut Français. So again, this is kind of the institutional model that we are working on and that we're the inheritors of as representatives of the French cultural network abroad. Um, so again, much has changed and our understanding of cultural diplomacy has very much evolved. And uh, even on a conceptual level, it's very difficult uh, to pinpoint what really culture means now nowadays and what, uh, how we can even essentialize what constitutes the core of a nation, of a community. Um, are you even becoming automatically a cultural ambassador of your country when you when you just are a French artist that goes abroad? You're essentializing the French culture in itself. And, and then uh, which aspects do you take of the culture? Is it only the high art of it, also the everyday habits? Um, so these are all questions that are conceptually um, up in the air. Um, but I think for France, at least over the years, um, there has been a new variety of actors involved, which has also changed and broadened the cultural strategy and means of action. So, for instance, the priorities of a director of an Alliance Française will be very different from the ones of a director of the Louvre Abu Dhabi, for instance. Um, an Alliance Française will be focused on promoting arts and language, uh, which often prioritizing language classes because it's kind of at the core of their economic model, um, whereas a director of the Louvre Abu Dhabi will see uh, cultural diplomacy embodied by the exchange of artworks and uh, museum training. So, of course, both of them are doing cultural diplomacy, representing the same country, but in a very different manner. And my position, I'd say, as a cultural attaché could be seen kind of as a mixture of both, uh, where in addition to advocating for the French culture and language on the ground, as would do an Alliance Française, I also push for cooperation between France and Sri Lanka through the means of professional exchange programs, as could be done by a museum such as the Louvre Abu Dhabi. Um, so in short, I think it's, it's hard to grasp what cultural diplomacy means, uh, even, yes, conceptually speaking, and there are some challenges. Uh, um, but I think um, there is also no consensus on the, what the means of action really means, given the variety of actors involved. So it kind of depends, I'd say, on the perspective on the, of the actor involved. Yeah. But I'm quite curious to see, Kelly, what um, your point of view would be, because it's also a different, a different form of a, a means of action um, of cultural diplomacy. <laughs> Kelly, um... As, as Aurelia is saying, across the Atlantic, how, how do things differ? Um, is there anything that you would contrast or highlight, um, perhaps as Aurelia has done, looking back historically to how cultural diplomacy was seen to perhaps the positioning of it today? Right, uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. And likewise, thank you for the invitation to join you all this evening. It's really nice to see faces and I'm glad that we can join together virtually. Um, very similar, I mean, we're a much younger country in comparison, right, the United States, but our, our concept of cultural diplomacy really did begin in earnest during the 1940s. It was established as an office of international information and cultural affairs. Then it became this concept called the International Information and Educational Exchange. And then through a series of laws and restructuring with uh, driven by our elected officials, it became fully housed within the Department of State inside the Bureau of Education and Cultural Exchanges. And so I think where from the US Department of State and the sort of um, official bilateral concept of um, cultural diplomacy, our goal is to increase mutual understanding between the people of the United States and the people of other countries through education and cultural exchange that will assist in the development of peaceful relations. So while we may not look solely at bodies of art, whether it's the visual or performing arts, we also look to put people together to talk about topics, whether it is through the Fulbright program 
or our International Visitor Leadership Program. Here in Sri Lanka, the Fulbright is celebrating its 70th year this, uh, this November. And um, uh, the International Visitor Leadership Program began, I believe, in the 1940s. And right now, around the world, there are over a million individuals who've participated in an officially sponsored exchange program where they've come to the United States and then returned to their home nations. We have over 450 former or current heads of state or government who have been part of an exchange program. And so I think for, for the Department of State, it's, it's very broadly defined what is cultural diplomacy. Um, but I think for me as a foreign service officer, it really boils down to the people to people component. When you bring artists to the United States or you bring artists, whether they're visual or performing artists to a foreign country, the the conversation about the art they're presenting, of course, happens, but it's in the, the actual conversation or the parallel making of the art where the real deeper exchange actually begins. And so one of the aspects I think that's really interesting for the Department of State is um, in our exchange programs, we, for the people that we bring to, to places overseas, these are artists and ambassadors of their craft, they come, they're, they're supported by the local embassies, but they do not have to agree with all US foreign policy. They are their own artists. They are, they are expressing their own views. And I think that's uh, one of the great attributes of, of this option that all nation states have is to bring the people together and they don't always have to, to say the official line. Um, and it opens doors and it dispels myths about one another. Hmm. Thanks, Kelly. I think what is very interesting to what I'm hearing from what you are saying and what Aurelia is saying is that there is this very broad understanding here of, of what constitutes culture from, from even the naming from when it was called information um, at the American side. And then again, how you can include in that language, teaching the teaching of languages, the um, exchange of knowledge, the, the training programs, et cetera. And of course it's, you know, I think this is, this is the thing that we can recognize is that culture as, a, as, as an entity is, is very broad in, in what can come in under it. Um, beyond maybe the artists, there's also, we might say there are um, dancers, musicians who are also artists, but also maybe um, there may be people who are, doing things maybe in sport, um, maybe who are doing things that are out of out of maybe what we would normally categorize as a kind of uh, more uh, limited idea of culture. And I think that's one thing that I'm hearing. And I think both of you have also um, mentioned too that that there's there have been certain institutions that have been set up um, perhaps um, out, you know, to, to run alongside the work of the state. Um, Aurelia has mentioned the Alliance Francaise. Of course, in, in Europe, we have as well the British Council, the Goethe Institute, um, and we should mention to the American Center, um, and particularly the American Center's history in Sri Lanka as being this place where so many people have come to, to um, experience um, and learn about um, American culture at, at different time periods. One thing I picked up on too was Aurelia saying, ah, artists ambassadors um, when when a French artist might produce or exhibit their work outside of France and and you've mentioned that um, are artists reflective of, of American for, foreign policy um, and those two ideas is what I'd like to turn to George with um, to bring you in George to perhaps talk to us about um, we know that this definition of culture is is broad and perhaps the same can be said of diplomacy. How do we therefore understand this term cultural diplomacy? Well, like what is specific about the diplomacy side when we think about this, this sort of broad notion of culture that, that Aurelia and, and Kelly have been um, introducing us to? Thanks, thanks, Shamini. Thank you, firstly, to the museum for the invitation and um, to join this panel. Certainly when we talk about culture and we talk about diplomacy, we're talking about two areas which are extremely old, which are extremely rich, which have evolved over periods of time, which are being added to, it's alive. Diplomacy is alive, culture is alive. 
if you look at it from the global perspective, we've been engaging in diplomacy for centuries. We can go back so many centuries to find archival material, documentation, the signing of treaties, meeting of envoys. The role of the diplomat was highly influenced through the power play that was taking place on the world stage. Leaders did not meet very often and they had to rely on their envoys, their special emissaries to go up there to the world and speak on their behalf. You had to be a good orator. You had to be also part of the nobility. You had to be, nepotism was not a term that was used back in the day. It was preferred if you were close to the leader when you were sent out there with a message. So it was restricted to one strata of society. But then gradually we saw the institutionalization of diplomacy from the establishment of embassies first to the ministries of foreign affairs several decades later to the gradual growth of the discipline but we've also now come to a point in which leaders are not only relying on diplomats for information. Leaders are tweeting, leaders are talking, leaders are texting, leaders are meeting all the time. Now the role of the diplomat has evolved. Diplomacy as a whole has, has evolved. This is where today we are focusing very much on negotiation. We're looking at strategizing. We're looking at how countries are able to <clears throat> look out there into the future, where they want to be, what they want to achieve. Diplomacy is an amazing tool in enabling countries to go about achieving their national goals. On the other hand, when we talk about culture, what isn't a part of culture? You've mentioned language, you've mentioned traditions, dance, music, norms, practices. We're going into the understanding of languages. Aurelia, for example, at the Alliance Francaise, it's not only the teaching of the French language. You don't just go there to learn the alphabet, to learn the vocabulary, learn the grammar and come out of there. No, you are exposed to French culture, French cuisine, French music, French dance, wine, you name it. There is a whole host of experiences that you gain from it. It's the same thing with the American center. You're going to immerse yourself in American documentaries, publications, literature, online platforms, journals, reference material, universities. This is where you, it's really culture is so much to so many people. But very often we hear a term where we, we hear people saying, oh, that is against our culture. We've heard this being used on various occasions. Now that is where we've got to stop and question, what is it against? For example, the language that we are communicating in today would have been considered to be against our culture in this island some time ago. The attire, the food that we eat today, so many things might have been conceived to be against our culture with an inverted commas at that point. But culture is not static. Culture is evolving. Today, when you look at food forms that we have, look at the different varieties of items that we eat, and just talking about Sri Lankan food only. If you look at the origins, if you look at where they're coming from, it's so diverse. We can't change history. History has had an impact on all countries. All countries have had their own trajectory. And this is where history has contributed to the cultural evolution that has taken place in countries. And in a country like Sri Lanka, where we have had a cultural practice for over 2000 years, I'm not saying that the culture that we experience today was there 2000 years ago, the forms of music, the forms of dance, the forms of writing, the forms of language, that we are talking about today were very different 2000, 2500 years ago. It's just that there's been an evolution. We've relied on the whole practical aspect and that is what makes it really rich. So going into the future, things that we might consider today to be against our culture or not in keeping with culture will become part of the norm. This is part of evolution. Charles Darwin talked about this. He said, the species that survives is the species that evolves. We're not going to be static. We're going to keep on evolving. So just like diplomacy is evolving, so is culture. And the beauty is we are now able to come and marry these two concepts. Now, mm -hmm. culture means a lot of things, a lot of people within a country. It's going to mean a lot more to people around the world. When you want to project, when you want to promote a certain aspect of a country, what do you select? There is such diversity. There is so much of diversity that creates opportunity. No country is bereft of this opportunity. All we've got to do is dig deep, whether it be literature, whether it be the arts, whether it be the finance, whether we're talking about specific areas, 
countries have got a lot to offer to the world. And that's the beauty. That's where we are moving into that realm of respect and understanding. Well, we talk about, in the world of diplomacy, sometimes we refer to this term of tolerance. Countries have to be tolerant. This is where we've got to go a step further in respecting. You don't know, you get to know, you respect the other's right to a certain form, a certain tradition, a certain norm. This is the beauty of cultural diplomacy, and that is what culture does to individuals. It does so much more for countries as well. Thank you, George. Uh, the, the point I, I think which I'd like to pick you up on, just to elaborate on a little bit more, is this projection of a country through its cultural um, production. How, how, to some extent, is that always, you know, trying to show the, the it's trying to show a positive um, image of the country. If, if we were to ask ourselves, what is the purpose? It is, after all, isn't it about some kind of reputation that we're putting out there? So, so the art, the cultural production is, is somehow synonymous with how we want to be seen by that rest of the world. Now, if that, would you, I mean, would you agree that, that that's, I mean, maybe the purpose um, is, is, is still there today? That Absolutely, absolutely. That is where when we talk about promoting of various aspects of culture, when we talk about trying to project it onto the world stage, you've got to be mindful of what you are going to project where. Now, there are certain countries Let's take, for example, a country like Kazakhstan, where horse meat is a part of their daily diet. Now, already I'm sure you'd agree with me that in France, it is banned, right? You don't exactly encourage the eating of horse meat. Now, if Kazakhstan wants to promote cultural diplomacy and has a horse meat, um, some kind of festival in France, it's not going to go down very well. You always want to project a positive image, a positive perspective, that is something that we are trying to do. That is what all countries want to do. We want to be out there giving people an impression that is going to attract them to the country. That attraction is going to help with tourism. It's going to help with investment. It's going to help with the promotion of the country. It's really going to have a very, very strong bonding factor. And this is where we've got to be mindful. If you look at it from a Sri Lankan perspective, what do we promote out there? What does the country select? What is our missions out there? All of our embassies, all of our high commissions out there, what do they select? What do they choose as their main focus? Now, this is something that we've got to be mindful of, right? So, and when we're talking about that aspect, I'm sure Kelly, you will be able to come in here. Uh, when we look at different aspects, I mean, how does America decide what you want to promote? How does France decide what you want to promote? Isn't that a tough one, Kelly? Isn't that a very tough call? Uh, well, I think it depends on the context of where you're where you're uh, crafting your exchange, right? And so that's very much driven by the nature of the bilateral relationship. So our cultural exchange programs are done in partnership with people in Sri Lanka. And so we're never going to design something that doesn't meet the goals and aspirations of our audience, which is primarily youth ages 15 up to 35 um, and helping them develop their craft or, or encourage their, their cross-cultural communication abilities. So yeah, I mean, I, but as far as what, what is the representational culture of the United States, my country is is so diverse. There isn't one version of what is, you know, people may say, oh, hamburgers, American <laughs> apple pie, you know, baseball maybe, but even that I would argue might not have just American roots. <laughs> Sorry, I, I seem to have been the one, I think that um, uh, lost the connection there. Um, I'm wondering here whether we, I mean, what, what I'm hearing from, from you all is that, you know, there's there's been a move in in cultural diplomacy um, from this very sort of state um, constructed image from from very early on to now something that has become less constructed, maybe um, less the state has played a, a less instrumental role. And I'm just wondering here where cultural diplomacy could be seen, therefore, as a, as a means at some level to mitigate what we could say are that these negative perceptions that are maybe created 
by higher level politics um, or by these rather kind of stereotypical tropes by which we might see America or, or, or France or, or any other country, Sri Lanka. Um, I'd like to ask perhaps Aurelia to talk a little bit um, in particular about the, the biennial model um, in, 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 this, in this respect, just as, as one approach perhaps where we might see this at work and, and, and as something having evolved as well. Yes, uh, thank you for this question, Charmini. So, um, for so for those that are unfamiliar with the, the event, so the um, the idea is the Venice Biennale has been founded in 1895 and is the oldest international contemporary visual arts exhibition and now has become the most celebrated one, serving kind of as a validating label for confirmed artists participating. And the particularity of the Venice Biennale is that soon after its inauguration, they created the national pavilions um, that hosted the nation's official artistic representation, if we can call it this way. And there are now uh, 90 uh, national pavilions at the Biennale. Um, so France was among the first nations to have a space for itself. And uh, the Institut Francais uh, that we were mentioning earlier has been in charge of its coordination since 1948. So this kind of um, means that it became a tool for cultural diplomacy. And these national pavilions really became kind of a form of arena uh, where countries could showcase the confirmed artists that from their respective countries that they wanted to push uh, also through the careful choice of curators. So it was very much telling of um, what was happening artistically uh, during each time. Um, and an interesting example of uh, cultural diplomacy in practice, let's say, uh, can be seen this year through uh, Zineb Zedira, um, partic participation to the current Venice Biennale um, through the French Pavilion. So she is the first French artist of Algerian origin and only the fourth women artist since 1912 uh, to represent the French pavilion in Venice. And the fact that she's French Algerian is of course very symbolic um, given the complicated colonial history between both countries. And as we celebrate in 2022, the 60th anniversary, uh, anniversary of Algeria's independence. So um, having made this choice this year is very much telling of the approach that um, diplomatically France has been trying to push. Um, and it's also interesting because she also decided to embrace this intricate relationship um, by composing her audiovisual installations around the political and intellectual solidarity between France, Italy, and Algeria, and also showcasing a Pan-African anti-colonial and Pan-Arabic movie called Algeria's Battle by Gillo Pontecorvo. And interestingly, this movie was censored in France when it was uh, released in 1966, which really shows how much the mentalities have changed since then, which it's now uh, an official platform uh, where we are showcasing it. And, and also moving away a bit from Venice, another example of this, I think, is uh, the French Algerian artist Kader Atia, uh, which you might have heard of, who is the creator of the ongoing Berlin Biennale, um, because he's also drawing upon his dual culture and he structured the Biennale around the theme of the colonial, colonial reparation, which he has been exploring uh, since two decades. And the Berlin Biennale, of course, is not managed by a French institution and there is no uh, <laughs> direct control over it, but the Institut Francais does support the participation of French artists within it, which I think indirectly validates politically its theme mm -hmm. as well. So what I think is, we're seeing with uh, this arrival of this new generation of artists and creators with double nationalities or foreign origin who are ready to address the wounds of the past, especially the open woods of the colonial past. And uh, I think it's very important, of course, for the memorialization process, but the, res the response of the institutions is also quite telling. And I think the Venice Biennale and the Berlin Biennale show us kind of two different models of French cultural diplomacy with Algeria. The first one through a pavilion that is really an official platform to position itself in the art world. And the second one through a more like subtle endorsement of a current post-colonial school of thought. Um, so, of course, uh, we don't really know if uh, if it will translate into uh, official political forgiveness and reparation, but it's, I think, a first step in the right direction, at least. 
It's, it's fascinating um, to hear about this, um, this kind of ideological change that has seemingly taken place with the choice of artists to now represent uh, to fr represent France. Um, to, to maybe add as well to those listening, um, as, as Aurelia has mentioned, the, the, the Giordani in, in Venice holds um, pavilions what they which are which are owned in fact by respective countries and there's something like 30 or 35 pavilions um, and on in alternate years they would do um, an art a visual arts uh, biennial and then um, the next year would do architecture the Sri Lanka actually doesn't have a national pavilion um, and it, it's just I think important to point out that, that this current biennial in particular has one of the collateral exhibitions going on that's been supported by the European Cultural Centre. Um, it's a, an event that has the work of Chandragupta Thenura and Saskia Pintleton. And, and I think just from the edges towards what might become changes in the future, it's very important to perhaps record that they are showing there as part of this larger event. And that, you know, there's one artist, Chandragupta Thenura, who has been a very um, emboldened um, critique artists critiquing the state um, and, and Saskia Pintleton who I think the inclusion of her is also asking that question of who represents the country um, of somebody who is is um, not a, um, a Sri Lankan um, by birth. Um, I just wanted to to mention that there that these are very important kinds of um, sort of more peripheral representations very importantly happening there in, in, in Venice. Um, Kelly, if, if I could bring you in here to um, ask you, if we start to think about these different approaches um, towards cultural diplomacy, where we don't have this very sort of direct involvement of the state, where we're working more in arm's length, um, who are these non-state actors um, that could carry out this work? Um, is, there, is there something in, 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 in that kind of um, I, I, arena perhaps where we could look a bit more at, at what is happening that is is um, working organizations perhaps or, or how, how do we look at it how do we understand these non-state participants sure well I I wouldn't call myself an expert I think we're surrounded tonight especially you with your knowledge of of the art world and and this concept but I I do think it should be embraced and encouraged um, organizations that can promote this people to people exchange, which is at the heart of the cultural diplomacy, however that is represented, whether it's through the visual or performing arts or the educational part of the cultural diplomacy um, museums right? Museums in the United States, I think it's the the private sector is really where for any nation state that that excels in representing um, overseas and engaging the the people the diaspora from the United States with other countries and uh, their home nation is is a big um, force of of energy to engage um, a nation state and the the population directly, but um, I think any arts organization universities, uh, the faculties on universities of arts, um, individual artists who find a thing that they become interested in and then they go deeply into it and they end up overseas and making art or people go to the United States and, and create art there as well. I do think that there is an important role for individuals outside of these bilateral relationships to open up different tracks of diplomacy, right? The track two and, and this cultural exchange. So I, I do think it's very important. Um, and I do think that um, when it is, when these shows and these exchanges are curated by people who have an expertise in art, maybe people who are historians, um, that it can provide a very nuanced and, and rich experience that may not uh, necessarily be the case in, in a program that I create. Um, I will say too, though, that even though, you know, I'm saying that civil society and private sector led institutions uh, can have a very important role in cultural diplomacy, even within the Department of State, we do have 
um, art historians, we have curators of art, we have people who are deeply expert in their craft to advise on the policy for promotion and protection of cultural heritage and preservation of cultural heritage overseas. Uh, everything from archaeologists to uh, experts in all forms of art. So, but I do think there obviously is, is a fantastic method for individuals to get to know one another in the cultural diplomacy realm, completely outside of the confines of a, of a state run program. Yeah, that I think is 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 definitely a direction that uh, we have seen happen in the last um, sort of 30, 40 years, um, particularly in the US and in Europe with with other organizations taking on the the role of trying to create these um, perhaps, you know, events, whether it's the Venice Biennial, making choices, selecting people just because they are informed. Um, you know, when we think about Sri Lanka, for example, um, we don't have really those kinds of institutions or cultural organizations um, who are being asked by the state, because I think that that invitation comes from the state, there's an endorsement um, from the state towards them, and it gives them a, it's, it's saying to them, you, you have an expertise that we do not have, and, and therefore you are best placed to make these decisions. Um, I think that's something um, very importantly um, that you're you're making um, there, uh, Kelly. Um, what what I wanted to turn to um, now was we've we've been mentioning cultural diplomacy, um, and and already at the beginning we said it was about particularly Aurelia gave us that metaphor of um, um, of the you know the rays of the sun um, of, of them projecting out and it somehow in my mind always that cultural diplomacy is all, all about what what foreign audiences need to see and 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 what what is it though that um what what about the domestic audiences um you know what about um the image or the the reputation of those that are doing things in the country that are they are they off are they at um kind of um, the other end, perhaps, of sometimes not what's being shown outside um, for, for whatever reason. Um, maybe, George, I'd bring you in um, to ask you whether, um, you know, does Sri Lankan cultural diplomacy um, in its broader sense, does it, does it reflect what's going on in Sri Lanka? Um, what, what are, are, there, are there competing narratives, perhaps, is, is what I want to ask you. Absolutely. And why do we have these competing narratives? Sri Lanka has gone through a lot in the last several decades. We are yet to write the political narrative. And this is where we sometimes tend to see the cultural narrative already being drafted, already being crafted and put out there, or being examined, explored. Whereas the political narrative has not been understood properly. There are competing narratives at that particular juncture. That is what we need to try to understand. When we want to project something internationally, when we want to talk about an aspect internationally, is it something that we're also talking about domestically? Is it something that we're also identifying within the country? How much are we doing to make sure that just as something Sri Lankan that is being put out there is also something Sri Lankan that is very much widespread across the country? Now, there's diverse communities in Sri Lanka, diverse traditions, and hence culture is very, very uh, open, very diverse, very, very fluid. And there's so much of one group understanding another group or having to understand or should be understanding another group, engaging in certain cultural practices. We've seen that to some extent, but maybe not at a desirable level. I'm sure we can see a lot more assimilation, a lot more coming together. But that's where we've got to first identify this Sri Lankan label. And this is something that we've got to first identify. I am Sri Lankan first, and then I belong to this community, this religion, this caste, this class, whatever it is, whatever divisions you want to talk about. We need to first sort out this, and that's why I keep using this term, political narrative within the country. We're first Sri Lankans, and then we are a lot of other things. Thereafter, the message that we are trying to send out into the world, into the international community, is going to be that much more cohesive. We're going to be able to, people are going to be able to understand us that much more. I mean, when you talk about people coming to Sri Lanka, visiting this island, tourism, 
business, for investment, whatever it may be, they are enthralled by what they see. There's a lot of things that we wouldn't think of promoting, projecting. I remember a British photographer who was based in Paris, who came to Sri Lanka right after the tsunami. And she was a photographer. And she took a series of photographs, which she thereafter exhibited in Paris. Now, some of those angles, some of those aspects that she projected of the country were things that we might never think of putting up, putting out there. I mean, she was looking from a very artistic point of view. She had visited a home along the beach which had been damaged by the tsunami and they were now managing by cooking in the garden because their structures had been destroyed by the tsunami. And she was photographing an empty clay pot which had been used to make a curry and there was a little bit remaining at the bottom with the curry leaves stuck on it. Now that was conveying a very strong message of how food is a necessity, people are trying to manage, but at the same time, there's diversity in the food in terms of what they're eating, but also talking about the tsunami. And she gave a different perspective of how we need to support ventures, support domestic communities, because these people are struggling. So we might think of projecting something very mainstream, something very well known. We'll talk about the World Heritage Sites, we'll talk about certain festivals in the country, certain rituals in the country, but maybe there's a lot more yet to be discovered. And this is where we've got to really get on this effort of where, I mean, several years after we've seen the end to the actual fighting on the island. Now, this is something very momentous. This is an opportunity for us to move forward, move ahead. A lot of things in the past have not been correct. Now we've got to correct some of these mistakes and try to move forward. How do we do that? By understanding each other. This is something absolutely important at the end of the day, until and unless we come to that platform of getting the political narrative right, discussing history. We can't put it aside. We can't brush it aside. We can't say certain things never happened. But that's influencing culture. That's influencing tradition. That's influencing diplomacy. That's influencing our message out there onto the world stage. Thank you, George. I think this, this point about having in Sri Lanka no sort of don't have those spaces of perhaps intro, introspection that, that, that we require first. Um, you know, if I was if an, I was an artist listening in on this uh, talk, you know, I, I, I might not just I might not see what I do as being something that would toe the line of, of the narrative um, of the state. Um, so what would I be doing then? You know, um, uh, how, how am I seen? Um, and if my work receives international attention, do I become a dissident artist? You know, am I, am I going to be showing work that would normally not pass through the um, approvals of the state? Um, and I do think it's something that Sri Lanka needs to, to, to try and take opportunities through various approaches, multiple approaches of how we can begin to understand certainly a lot of what's or what's being produced by artists, writers, um, as they're producing it. And, and I think the gatekeepers, whether it's the state or the institutions, are not always able to or not always willing to take that work out there because they themselves are not comfortable with it. Um, Kelly, if I if I could turn to you, um, perhaps to look at this. Um, maybe sort of this 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 black white situation, or if you like, this external um, versus domestic cultural policy um, issue, um, and to talk us through perhaps you know in the U.S. how that was dealt with, what you know what was going what was going on on the ground in the fifties and the sixties, and yet what was being shown outside uh, to the rest of the world. Um, any examples that, that, that come to mind or any thoughts there um, as something that, that the US has already kind of grappled with? 
the exhibit that was created in the United States called Advancing American Art in 1946. And it was um, comprised of a number of modern artists from the United States um, in, a, in a modern art style and sent to two locations around the world, one to Eastern Europe and to Latin America. And it was designed to reach individuals who were in um, nation states that were undergoing transformation towards communism and um, maybe experiencing some suppression um, of, ex of expression um, by the nation state. And so it was just an example of, okay, here are American artists discussing concepts uh, in art let's send it overseas and see what happens. And, you know, uh, in spite of it being lauded overseas by uh, audiences abroad, um, our elected officials at the time did, did not appreciate the art that was selected. They, they, they decried the, the form of the art, the subjects of the art. They thought it didn't represent America in this concept. And so in the end, the show was, was pulled down. It did not complete its tour. And um, it was then auctioned off and put into archives. And, and today in America, there are all kinds of reflection um, and re revisionings of that, ex of that exhibit of the exhibition that went abroad and attempts to recreate the show, whether in books or uh, smaller institutions around the United States, trying to find the individual pieces of art that were auctioned off in the end to recreate it as a, as a moment of reflection of like, okay, this, this thing went out into the world. It was representative of American artists, but then it was pulled down because it wasn't considered proper or good enough, or maybe uh, some one individual's concept of what is an American artist or what does American art represent. And so I think that's, um, I mean, I think that is part of the American tradition is to reflect on um, our own history very deeply and to to look at what has happened. And, and there's always going to be an academic or an individual who revive, who brings up a thing and and looks at it again and encourages other people to look at what, what mistakes were made, what might have been better, or how could we have been more representational and more diverse in, in what we've done. Um, I mean, I, I could go on about different museums that have been created in the United States now that are very much um, in that reflective mode. The National Museum of African American History and Culture is a super important institution passed by an act of Congress in 2003, opened its doors in 2016. It is um, a testimony to the African American experience and culture, history of enslavement, and contributions of African Americans to American society. And in its programming, attempts to encourage people to uh, think about the diversity and inclusion and those shared values that we talk about and what might make um, America, America. Thank you. I, I... Sure. Actually, with those two examples from the time of that um, exhibition when it when it went out to to tour, um, it was also the same kind of time that that interestingly, Louis Armstrong was was put forward as a, as a cultural ambassador. Um, and music is is something we haven't really mentioned, but obviously I think would be encompassed in our very broad definition of culture. Um, but what I remember reading in his um, biography is that he, I mean, he, 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 he really, he did amazing things um, by going out there as this black American, but he was under strict orders not to talk about slavery. Um, and that's quite interesting as now, of course, with, with, as you're talking about um, the David Ajay Museum, Design Museum, um, things have shifted ideologically um, in in the US um, somewhat. Um, no doubt there's um, further um, further changes that need to happen. Um, one, one, one last question um, before we open up to um, conversation, uh, the conversation with um, those attending. And we've got a lot of questions in the in the chat. Um, this series is, is called Support Local Art. Um, we've talked about a um, kind of broad definition of art, um, but the producers of it, um, 
you know, the artists themselves. We haven't got any artists on this panel, um, which I, I just want to, to point out. And when we did approach um, a number of artists to, to be on this panel, it was interesting that they turned down the invitation. Um, this is Sri Lankan artist. Um, they were initially, I think what it was, was skeptical about what they would be saying about art that had some kind of toed the line, um, what it means, I think uh, George mentioned, you know, do we have to understand what it means to be Sri Lankan first and then look at our maybe ethnic makeup, our religious, our economic. Um, and, and this for a lot of artists, I think, was 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 not something that they um, wish to wish to kind of get involved with talking about. I think generally skeptical. But there were a group or a number of people who we talked to, too, who turned down the invitation because they were apprehensive about being heard. And again, it goes back, I think, to perhaps not towing the, the line, the narrative um, of, of, of what constitutes Sri Lanka. Um, and I, I'd like to maybe here ask Aurelia to um, maybe suggest perhaps what what would you listening you know to the artists on 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 the call today and and, and those who are listening who are involved with um, supporting art um, what what would you encourage artists to feel um, like that you know what would you encourage to happen to make artists to help artists feel they're being heard um, because the art you know the art is made by them the government doesn't make this art uh, the films are made by filmmakers the photographs are taken by photographers um, so just wondering from you what what kind of opportunities um, you might suggest we need to kind of perhaps start thinking about to to bring these maybe what might be alternative uh, voices, narratives into um, this kind of limelight of what we're describing as, as cultural diplomacy? Yes, well, it's a very broad question. And uh, of course, it's just an open brainstorming because there is no definitive answer for it. And uh, and yeah, it's, it's difficult to narrow it down to a few uh, magical solutions. <laughs> uh, but I think the first the first point I think is to to think of artists as being part of a creative ecosystem and not just um, figures that are just alone by themselves that institutions just go to punctually. Um, so this really entails kind of different things. The first one being that there needs, I believe, I think, to be an understanding of the cultural and creative economies as being essential to local development, because one of the shortcomings I identify in Sri Lanka is the lack of numbers and figures and um, and val value of, uh, of the creative industry in, in this matter. And just to give a reference, um, for instance, it has been estimated that the sector accounts for $36 billion in India. So of course, uh, there's no point in comparison uh, between countries, but it's just to, to show that it's such an enormous opportunity for local development, which is sometimes is, can be quite untapped um, in Sri Lanka. And it's just a matter of framing it as an, as an economic opportunity to allow also uh, a variety of actors to play in this field and not just seeing this as like a non-profit area that uh, will never be part of the of the economy and the, and, and society. Um, so I think having a stronger creative economy would also lead artists feeling that they're a part of an ecosystem that will support and allow them to really flourish artistically with less precariousness. And, and this implies, of course, re recognizing a, a variety of actors and private actors and the, play, the role that they can play, um, which can be through sponsorship, uh, it can be through a variety of, of actions. Um, the most straightforward translation of this is the film industry, where, of course, the industry is at the core of the support of filmmakers around the world, and this is what allows the, the industry to, to, to sustain itself and the art to actually happen. Um, so I think it's, it's important to think of it as an ecosystem and not just independent um, variables. Um, the second one, I think, is uh, is more on professional training and education, which is, of course, 
very important. And for that, I wanted also to take this opportunity to, to congratulate you, the MMCA, for the, the, the work that you do also on this and how you put education and out outreach at the center stage of your project. And I really think that this is the type of direction, direction that the creative sector in Sri Lanka would, should be going towards, uh, to putting it really at the core. So really. Congrats. <laughs> um, and, uh, and the third one, I, I just wanted to share it's a more um, experimental reflection <laughs> and more conceptual. <laughs> but it's, it's an idea that came with me uh, to me when I was listening to um, the director of the Palais de Tokyo this summer in Paris called Guillaume Desanges. So he has this concept of um, institutional permaculture. So the idea is to borrow from the idea of um, agricultural permaculture, and, and it comes from the fact that indeed all around the world, uh, artists are feeling that they're not being seen and that ideas are not translating into projects sometimes or that it's hard to find opportunities. And he says that institutions, which is true, uh, especially museums and exhibition spaces, um, can only show a very small percentage of the research that they actually do and the ideas that actually come to them because of course they have the constraint of space and they have the, the constraint of what they can actually show and the, 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 the synthesis that they have to show. Um, so this idea, like his idea at least, is to kind of have this uh, institutional recycling of ideas to avoid kind of the waste of ideas. So it, it's very conceptual, but it kind of translates into platforms where different actors could also collect the ideas and projects that weren't used to create something out of it artistically. Um, so this kind of comes back also to the question of being part of an ecosystem and a form of institutional solidarity that, uh, that I think should prevail to, to kind of make something out of it and to, to allow for artists to be, to be heard and seen, uh, even if one institution at one specific time cannot put forward a project, then it's, it's something that, uh, that can be reused in another manner. So it's just uh, yeah, food for thought, but it's quite open <laughs> for discussion. Amazing. Your, your reflections on it. <laughs> yeah. Was, um, no, those were all, um, I was trying to write them down and I couldn't fast enough. Um, amazing suggestions there, all of those. Um, I, I'd like to invite, um, as, as we want to uh, perhaps open, before we open up to some of the questions that are coming in, I just would like to know whether maybe Kelly, if, if there were any um, suggestions, opportunities that you think would be, would be great to see in Sri Lanka where this um, well cultural diplomacy in the in you know in the in the in the sense of being able to be more inclusive towards perhaps artistic voices that would feel rather um, excluded um, that would not necessarily be the um, the norm in terms of what Sri Lanka goes out there and presents to the rest of the world um, what what would we need to see happen perhaps um, or what are, what are the kinds of opportunities that we need to be thinking about it, it is a really broad question. I think we could have a, a, oh. a talk about that, a whole separate session, right? So I was thinking about uh, listening and thinking earlier when, when you talked about the, the programming for the French language and George was describing it, the American Center also offers what is called the English Access Micro Scholarship Program. And it is for uh, young adults ages 15 to 18. Uh, we seek gender parity and identity uh, equality within these groups and they learn English for two years, but it's not just English, it's the whole, kit and caboodle, as they say, the, the ideas of working together and leadership and expression and learning how to have conversations, debates in English and, and learn about one another's culture even here on the island. So students get to share about themselves and learn about other people from the island. And they do conversational exchanges between Jaffna and Kandy and Matara in our different locations. So I do think that when, when it comes, I don't want to second guess what the rationale of an artist might be to not wanting to participate in a panel like this. But I would say that for any anywhere in the world, um, even the United States, this is uh, we need to ensure that people are safe to express their opinions, right? So you need to have legal frameworks that ensure you know, freedom of expression to you know, a certain extent, but 
ensure people have the right to dissent, ensure that people have a right to express their opinion. But that's not really enough. We have to learn how to engage in conversation with people that are different from us. We have to learn how to have conversations with someone that we don't agree with or with someone that we don't know. And it is not something you just learn, you, you can just do. It's something that has to be learned over time. And so I think one area where any anywhere in the world could benefit is, is in the education sector at the primary, secondary, and tertiary levels is to continue to offer opportunities for students to think critically to be introspective, to have opportunities to speak in front of groups, to have opportunities to debate subjects in a, under the guidance of an adult who, who understands how to navigate and negotiate moments where we might not know the other person or we might not agree about a certain topic. To not be afraid to have that reflection on very difficult topics that our nations face. And I mean, this is the challenge of every generation is how do we raise up our children to have the ability to think reflectively on our own histories and on our own communities and how can we make a difference? And so I, I would hope that anywhere in the world, if you start evolving educational curriculums to encourage that um, experiential learning uh, for students that eventually it will turn into having the ability to converse on subjects openly and without fear of retribution. I mean, you're always going to be nervous, even in the United States, if I'm expressing an opinion that's very different from everyone that's around me, it is a little bit scary, but it is something that you can push through as an adult and in a, and in a, in a graceful manner. So maybe that's something to consider, but I haven't yet met an artist who, who isn't willing to have those types of conversations, but maybe not, maybe it has to be in a different format. So I have found as a diplomat, I'm very grateful for Zoom and grateful for our online world that, that got us through the pandemic and allowed our American corners to continue programming and outreach with Sri Lankan youth. But I do recognize that there is something lost and there's a huge vulnerability to speaking openly and, and publicly and frankly, earnestly online. And the conversations that can happen offline in the analog world are, are very different and sometimes more robust than, than what can happen online. Just a thought, so we want to get back to people to people face to face someday. <laughs> you certainly do. Um, I'm, 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 I'm going to um, turn us to some of the questions that have been rolling in. Um, we have so many questions. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna take the one from the top here, which is, is actually for George. And it's a good segue from what you were saying, Kelly, when you're talking about um, education or the, the role of education. It's a question for George, which is, as an educator of international relations, how do you think the interest of future generations in cultural education and practice can be shaped through formal education structures such as universities and schools? Broad question, but um, perhaps there it might be again, one or two highlighted points you, you, you could comment on there. Definitely, Shamini. This is where we've got to start in schools. Children have got to be taught about different forms, different cultures. That's where you're going to evolve that concept of respect because you're going to learn about the others. You're not going to be in this vacuum, in this uh, cocoon where you are only exposed to something that you are growing up in, but you are exposed to the diversity on the island. And this is something that must start in schools, the results of which we will see 20 years down the line. But what, we go, what are we going to do right now? This is where in the current context, spaces such as this, many platforms that are being organized, you mentioned Kelly, having Zoom has been an amazing platform. I mean, any of the other online platforms interaction, this is where people are coming together. We're talking, we're meeting, we're discussing. We're agreeing to disagree in the process as well. And that's part of the process. Rather than me staying in my room and you staying in yours and me in my world and you in yours and we just uh, don't cross each other's paths. No, that's not the solution. We've got to meet, we've got to understand, we've got to go beyond that into the respect realm. And this is where starting in schools is definitely one of the most essential starting points. But that is where also 
you're going to need to go into a much bigger policy debate there, Shamini. We're going to go into revision of education policy, incorporating various aspects of history, incorporating various aspects of diversity of culture in this country, how things have originated, addressing topics that we might not be too comfortable in addressing. We've got to talk about it. We can't brush it aside. We can't say it never happened. That's not going to happen. You can't forget. I mean, the whole idea of this evolution process is not forgetting anything. It's just a case of being mindful, but being able to move ahead as well. If we don't do that, I mean, uh, Aurelia, we've had this conversation before as well. You come from a country which was occupied by your neighboring country. Today, you don't look at your neighboring countrymen and consider them to be the enemy. Oh, we have nothing to do with the neighboring country. You don't have that attitude. But that's because there has been a correction that has been done, that has been woven into society at every level, whether it be through secondary education, whether it be through tertiary education, in society, through culture, through the political narrative, through investment, through economics, through commerce. France and Germany have come together. This is where there's, just, there's so much for us to learn in that process where we've got to start removing the blinkers. We've got to start looking at that bigger picture. We may not like everything that we see, but we've still got to look at it. We still see it. It's still there in front of us, right? Do we choose to ignore? Now, that's something that we've got to ask ourselves. Do we want to do that? Is that the right thing to do? It's not. It's not. And this is where going forward, certainly starting in schools, but then the result of that will be seen decades to come. What are we going to do right now? We must take steps right now. Shamini, how you take a lot of effort in terms of promotional of uh, promotions of different artists at the museum. Now, how many of us take time to visit museums to try to understand aspects of history? How many of us take time to read history? At least the versions that are available. How many do that? How much do we reflect upon these aspects? Is this something to do with the fact that we're caught in this entire socioeconomic dilemma that we face on a daily basis? You know, it's a rat race that people are going through. They're trying to put food on their table. They're trying to make a living. They're trying to have some kind of savings. They're not thinking of the bigger picture. Maybe, maybe that's contributing to the overall decline uh, of uh, certain aspects of society that we are seeing today. We are not reflecting on the past, hence we are repeating it. Sorry, Shamini, coming there. No, I was just going to um, um, uh, say, I, I think we can come back to some of what you're saying. There's a couple of other questions that, that bring that up, uh, another side of that that come up. Um, but just moving through one of the other questions that um, I think is a really good one. Um, somebody has asked, can cultural diplomacy inform a state's foreign policy? So going the other way, kind of from the bottom up. What what um, do do our panelists think of of that? Who would like to take that question? Does it happen in America and France? <laughs> <laughs> I I would say yes. I can't identify uh, where, but certainly I would. I mean, but then it's what. The question was, can cultural diplomacy influence state policy? What was the foreign, sorry. foreign policy? Foreign policy. So, so what we've been, I suppose, assuming or our understanding of cultural diplomacy is being something that comes out of the state. Um, that now, what what they're perhaps asking is, um, can can there be maybe it's a cultural diplomacy made at arm's length to the state that comes back in to start to influence what foreign policy might be doing, connecting two different perhaps sides of, of uh, government? Uh, for me, it's a really hard question, but the, the word that comes to mind is uh, the intersectionality of all of us. And, and maybe I'm having a hard time uh, decoupling it from, you know, civil movements, civil rights movements and 
uh, civil society and social movements in the United States, if that could be considered a form of cultural diplomacy, and how from, from those movements up, it's it certainly for the US foreign policy is this emphasis on diversity, inclusion, and, and parity among identities, and uh, to really en enhance a human rights agenda. Uh, and to support human rights development. But that's, I don't know if you could consider those things as part of cultural diplomacy. But I do think that that, if you look at it as art, yes, somewhere in there, I would think that it is all influenced since foreign policy is made by people. <laughs> in the end, it's, it's made by people. <laughs> Yes, I was just going to corroborate what Kelly is saying for at least from our side, um, a very important aspect of what we call cultural diplomacy is uh, the it's something called the debate of ideas. So we organize a lot of conferences. And for us, it's also a matter of identification, the actors in the civil society, as Kelly was mentioning, to see also what could be leading to a more um, bilateral cooperation and more inform information on uh, what uh, is civil society, uh, I don't know, different uh, movements and uh, advo advocate, yeah, more. Uh, what do you call it? Yes, some <laughs> movements that would be uh, um, important to know for also the political section of the embassy. And quite often what happens is that if we invite someone for a conference or if we meet someone that could be interesting for our cultural events, then it can lead to um, more closer cooperation with them on different matters. Uh, so it's definitely, definitely linked. And uh, it's also the point is to be uh, coherent in our strategy. If it would be completely uh, um, separated, there must be a, some form of problem down the line as well. So, so it's also important to always keep in mind that the politics uh, have to be in line with, uh, with what we do, um, I think. I've got another question here, um, which is a long question. I'm just going to take a portion of it. Um, I hope I do justice to, to the person asking this. It's a great one. They're asking, how does one differentiate between the idea of soft power and cultural diplomacy? Can they be differentiated? And could cultural diplomacy be considered a systematized and ambient form of international state power, and perhaps more insidiously, state violence? George, I'm wondering whether that's something um, you could you could help us with, maybe with the first part. That how would we differentiate between this idea of soft power and cultural diplomacy? Can they be differentiated? This is where cultural diplomacy, culture, is an essential part of soft power. This is where Joseph Nye has theorized on. This is where several theorists have looked at this concept. This is where culture is a tool that can be used by states in order to promote, in order to achieve national objectives, national goals, in keeping with national strategies. So when you talk about differentiating the two, now today the concept of soft power is evolving as well. Soft power is not only culture. Soft power is economic assistance, loans, grants, they're going into another arena as well. So it depends on what aspect of soft power you're talking about there. But certainly within that basic understanding, or within the given international relations terminology of soft power, there is a key component of culture that is incorporated into it. So I don't think we can separate the two because we've also got to understand that countries are trying to project, promote what they have within, what they encompass, what they have built up over periods of time. That becomes a tool in their hands. That becomes a power tool in their hands, I guess, at that point. Mm. Um, I'm going to go to this wonderful question by um, from an artist. Um, she says that um, I am a bimodal immigrant holding dual nationality, born, born in Sri Lanka, but living in the UK. And despite having had uh, having many works in Tate Britain, in the collection, um, addressing my native Sri Lanka, cult my native Sri Lankan culture, tinged by our colonial past, I still feel a great deal of apprehension and also bear a sense of occupying an outsider existence. 
of not feeling worthy enough to comment on the current political strife. If I dig deeper, I think I, shall, I, think I still carry the yokels of our colonial past and are um, weighed down by this, um, what she describes as the thumper philosophy. If you don't have anything nice to say, then say nothing at all. Um, what 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 do we um, what what kind of responses could we have uh, from maybe um, I'm just wondering Aurelia there where you you know when when someone is living an artist living outside of this 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 culture um, but comes is of the culture um, it's 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 something that we often see amongst the the diaspora um, who, whether they can represent the nation or whether they cannot. Um, just, just interested perhaps there to see whether there's um, anything that um, you could you could just comment on, um, or Kelly or George for that matter. Well, yes, I think it's a very interesting question. I think in France is more the, the reverse situation that, that happens where it's foreigners that have been living in France for a very long time and that feel that they, they would be worthy of course of representing France abroad and uh, and that poses the question of is nationality the only basis of of being part of a culture and and at least for us usually the criteria that we have is more to be a resident uh, in France so it can be a foreigner that is living in France for 20 years uh, they can apply for um, call for projects or or different opportunities that would allow them to go um, represent their work abroad, um, which is, I know it's different from the, from the question of the diaspora, but I do think that um, it poses less the question for France because in general, the diaspora still comes back and forth maybe more often or still feels this legitimacy uh, a bit more. And that's where the, the, the colonial past plays a huge role in terms of power dynamics. So what we're trying to have advocate more is kind of like the, the, the reverse situation, let's say, to be more inclusive of artists that would be living in France and working in France and producing in France to, to have opportunities to showcase their work just on the same um, status as French artists. Um, yeah, which sometimes poses administrative <laughs> limits, of course, but <laughs> I guess that's the, what we try to push for. <laughs> I, th I think the problem is also compounded by who speaks for who, because um, there's inevitably always this this selection going on, and and that's rather invisible from the um, what what eventually goes out. We we see the artwork, we see the artists, um, but we don't quite know who has made, who's been instrumental in choosing them, um, how the funding structures have worked, etc. And I think um, what this artist is, is also saying is that there's you know there's this apprehension from local artists, there's apprehension from internationally based artists, and I, and I think it's also important to perhaps consider too that those making these decisions who we might have um, criticized before for being gatekeepers, they also need to change. Um, they also need to be people who are uh, able to see this in a much more 360 kind of viewpoint um, and, and be able to understand too that the perhaps the experiences from whether it's outside of Sri Lanka for argument's sake or inside Sri Lanka that this will in in depending on the context will will add and give value always to I think what we're what we're all in agreement of is that um, we need a space um, of this deep in, introspection um, which we just have never um, really felt we could have because we we've, we've been well quite I, I think quite frankly people have been uh worried about creating such spaces um for fear of of some kind of retribution towards their work or, or decisions that get made in funding that work or talking about it even I mean in the most extreme situation um I I have one um one last um question as I think we're going to run out of time um this is, this is directed to Kelly and, and Aurelia. And the question is, in a post-colonial context, how do you ensure that cultural diplomacy does not feed a, a savior complex, ensuring that both parties are treated equally throughout an exchange dialogue? 
I, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, the the most amazing experiences I've had for this diplomat and working in public diplomacy is when the artists come together. And I'll, I'll just get to the performing arts, but also in our exchange programs, um, people go from Sri Lanka to the United States and they meet individuals who are completely outside of the state system, all in civil society and private sector. And they're, they're, it is a two-way street. So the hosts in the United States are learning all about Sri Lanka from the Sri Lankan exchange participants. And it's the same for the performing arts, whether it's uh, dance groups or musical groups, when they come overseas, uh, they're coming from the United States as, as ambassadors, as arts uh, ambassadors. They get in the studio and they learn the art craft, the style from the local artist. It is not a one way street. It is not here is an American artist come to teach you anything. It is an absolute exchange absolute musical style exchange, absolute exchange of dance moves, of traditions, of the backgrounds of the traditions. So I, I don't think I've ever um, been a participant in or an observer of a Department of State sponsored exchange program. That was, that was one way. It is most definitely a two-way street. And what I've seen is uh, the artists that that come overseas and then go back to the United States, I have never seen a moment where those artists do not remain in contact with the people that they met while they were overseas. And in fact, they continue to create art together afterwards, or they continue to exchange ideas, maybe through through social media or through texting or just staying in touch. Uh, so it's it definitely enriches the lives of uh, an art and craft of both both sides of the equation, whether it's in the arts or if it's at, in the Fulbright Exchange Program or the International Visitor Leadership Program, or even our English language fellows that come to Sri Lanka and teach teachers on teaching people. Uh, they they leave the island, they leave their experience enriched and and more knowledgeable um, about Sri Lanka and Sri Lankan people. Aurelia, would you like to maybe round us off? Yes, no, I, I completely agree with Kelly. I think it's it, the idea is just to put yourself on the same basis. There is no, uh, uh, as, as Kelly was saying, there is no one way uh, collaboration. It's always, always an exchange. And also in terms of representation, we try to often push for an equal amount of uh, French and Sri Lankan artists. Most of the time, there's actually more Sri Lankan artists because it's it's harder to, to bring down French artists, especially these last two years. Uh, but in, the idea is just to always be on an equal ground and just to show that each other can, uh, they, they both can learn from each other. Uh, but it's true that it's a question that I think is, is very important to, to explicitly pose uh, because it is something that is in the air and that will be there when you're working in cultural diplomacy um, in, a, in a foreign country, uh, especially when there is this, this historical weight. And I think it's important to always be mindful and always be conscious of it in all actions that you're doing and pose the, pose down and ask yourself the question, are you doing something that is being mindful of that power dynamic? And I try to always keep that in mind in everything that I do, um, because I think unconscious biases also can 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 come into play. And, you know, and it's it's has to be a conscious and active um, process, I think. <laughs> so it is a very important question. <laughs> Certainly. Um... I'm going to have to um, wrap us up here. Um, there are so many questions. Um, they're almost like, I mean, what could be fascinating little essays in their own right. They, it's, it's really got people um, thinking, I, I have not been able to, to go through all of them. And um, what, I, what I do think is that this we should continue this discussion. Um, and certainly I think what, this last um, hour and a half has has indicated is that this cultural diplomacy really does remain this very rich area <clears throat> of of inquiry um, in asking about you know who speaks for who who has the rights what what image of 
in the case of Sri Lanka, do we want to start projecting out there? When are we going to move away from, you know, candy and dances and images of elephants? Um, I love elephants, but, you know, images of, of Sri Lanka that don't feel like they reflect at all what the, the cultural production has been over the Lahore of the last 20, 30, 50 years even. Um, when are we going to do justice to that? Um, and I think this, this, this note that is coming through very loudly is also that we need to create this kind of these spaces um, inside Sri Lanka um, through things that both Kelly and um, Aureli have spoken about that will be maybe more happening at arm's length from the government that would be much more led by people who have a certain kind of expertise that the government will never have um, and that those things can become advocacy bodies towards perhaps even you know um, being able to influence um, what happens at um, government uh, foreign policy even um, and why not these people are there they're voted in and represent this country um, and I think we don't make enough uh, use of the uh, the the kind of um, advocacy that that we as a group of people in professions um, should be uh, putting forward um, as arguments, um, namely the case for culture, the importance of it, of representing Sri Lanka on the international stage with with all of the complexity that is is going on in the country, but also those artists that have relationship with, relationships with it from outside as well. Um, so definitely. Um, I think this is a space that um, we're going to watch very, very carefully um, as we go forward. I'm going to, um, I'd love to um, carry on speaking with three of you and, and hearing also these questions come in. I'd like to thank you, Aurelia, um, George and Kelly for joining us today. Your insights have been really sagely um, they've given us so much to think about um, from the museum's perspective, but I think those listening, I hope it's also been very productive about thinking about this area of cultural diplomacy. Our gratitude as well to Saskia Fernanda Gallery and the Nations Trust Private, uh, Nations Trust Private Banking for their support of this program. And we'd like to just lastly let everybody know that the third and final talk of Support Local Art Talks Edition 2 will be happening next Sunday, same time, 6 p.m. to 7.30, and it's going to be hosted by Pramoda Virasekara, who is Assistant Curator of Education and Public Programs at the MMCA, and she will be in conversation with Block and Dino, the political cartoonist Gihan de Chikara, and I will be on the panelist side, and what we're going to be talking about, with no surprise, is the power of humour. Last but not least, I'd like to give a big shout out to the back end where we have been able to keep going despite a few um, technology issues. And I would like to say thank you so much to Pramoda and also to Shami and to Aisha um, who have been keeping us going all the way through. So thank you again to all of you and for everyone for tuning in.